Good evening and welcome to another presentation of Sefer Academy. I'm Dr. Stephen Pigeon. This is June 9th, 2022. Uh, an interesting year, an interesting month, an interesting day, an interesting time in which we are living. Tonight's discussion, we're going to be focused on the concept of life after death and to see what scripture says about that issue. You know, many of us ask the question, what happens after we die? Some believe there is nothing following this life, just an end to the consciousness and a perpetual darkness. This condition is described in scripture and is called Sheol. Those who led Judea held various views on this, some in agreement, some claiming that there was something called the resurrection, even a life after death. Many of us have been taught that immediately after death, we will be in paradise or heaven seeing the Messiah sitting on his throne and joining other loved ones in worship and praise, holding a harp and singing. It sounds pretty nice, actually. If there is a consistent theme in scripture concerning life after death, is there one? What do the prophets speak of in regard to this issue? Most importantly, what are the words of Yahusha in respect of this issue? And how do we make sense of it now? Is there an agreement between the ancient writers and those who penned what we call the New Testament? Surprisingly, there is an agreement, and it may be much different than what you have been told. One proponent of the resurrection wrote, and I quote, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Let us see what this means. All right, outstanding. Okay. I like my own opening. There's a shock. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> Okay, let's bring up the presentation. Okay, Sefer Academy production, Life After Death. And you know, I have to tell you that uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind everybody that all of the chapters and verses that are cited here in this production come from the Sefer Millennium Edition, which is available at sefer.net. Uh, this is, of course, um, the company that, uh, you know, which I lead. I'm the founder and the president and the CEO and the chief cook and bottle washer, although we have fantastic help from so many people now that are really in the trenches, slogging it out from David and Penny Castro to Elaine DeStefano to the staff at the Montana warehouse who do just, you know, tremendous amount of work to the people that are that are working in support for Sefer, like uh, Tina Agundes and like uh, Jessica Nock and Shell Wagner and others who are really just putting in the time um to uh, to further getting the message of the sefer across I want to thank all those people and i want to thank our interpreters too you know we have pietro and monica and esther in italy doing work for us and of course asif in uh, in pakistan doing work and manuel and and the other uh the other friends of the sefer who have been working on the spanish edition translating blogs and editing the sefer into a spanish edition it is available in the spanish by the way as are several other books like Havot and Rashith, also available in Spanish. There's a Spanish blog on the website you can check out. At the website, sefer.net, you'll also find my blogs, uh, which are quite extensive. You'll, there's a link to Sefer Radio, Sefer Radio there on the website, which will put you in touch with the podcasts that we do, including a rebroadcast of the Sabbath meeting, which takes place on Saturday morning. At least for me, it's Saturday morning. For some people, it's Saturday evening at the far points of the world. But we do gather for Shabbat and a, really a great family, and we discuss many things. And if you can't be a part of that, you can download the podcast through Sefer Radio, through Sefer Radio. And of course, there's many other things we have at the Sefer website, including a, a whole plethora, if you will, of uh, free download options that you can check under resources and find in addition to the information. These videos are also archived in a playlist at Sefer Publishing Group's YouTube channel under Sefer Publishing Group. You'll be able to find them in the playlist together with, I don't know how many other videos we have up there, hundreds, I think, of other videos that we have done. And uh, of course, you can reach me by email at stephen at sefer.net. And I'll be happy to discuss things that we can't discuss in the chat here. I try to answer as many comments as I can on the uh, on the uh, this video here at YouTube and on Facebook. You know, at YouTube, you need to be a subscriber to 
uh, to be able to chat. But when you chat, of course, uh, I try to respond as best I can and as quickly as I can. I think the last uh, video we had 386 responses. So there was a lot to uh, discuss over this last week. And uh, I want to encourage you, though, to make comment. And uh, especially if you have something that you want to add about a scriptural citation or some other insight, all of that is always welcome and it's always good to receive it. So I just wanted to encourage you in that respect. If you subscribe and of course, if you hit the bell, you'll be given notice at the last minute as to when we're going to do the next production because it's invariably the last minute. Uh, but uh, the last minute will tell you that what we're going to do in the topic of, of the show, what it's going to be. Uh, tonight, I was a little bit slow because, of course, I had, um, you know, we've been working very hard since the snow melted and uh, trying to catch up on life. And uh, we're starting to get ahead of that now. So we're feeling a little bit better. But tonight's presentation, you know, has been on my heart for a while. Life after death, life after death. I was going to do this last week, but of course, I had an obligation to discuss Shavuot. And uh, what a wonderful feast it is. And I think many people are starting to see, you know, one of the things it's like, one of the things that the whole world is kind of in agreement, in agreement on is high noon, you know, high noon. Um, but I think we're also in agreement on Shavuot. It was so, so crazy, this last Shavuot, not crazy, but blessed, really, that the Jewish world, the Messianic world, and the Christian world all agreed on this day, June 5th as the day to celebrate Pentecost slash Shavuot. And uh, what an incredible thing that is. When I think about it now, I think about how powerful is Yah's handiwork, how powerful it was in the time of Moshe, how powerful it was in the time of Noah, and how powerful it was in the time of the Talmudim or the disciples who were in the upper room waiting for the Ruach HaKodesh. And what we see is, is that Yah's hand has moved, and it's moved with um, benevolence, and uh, and it's moved with benevolence as compared to the bringing of the law of sin and death, and the, the covenant of the ten Devarim, which took place at Mount Horeb. Instead, we have this covenant of life, a renewed covenant of Brit Hadashah, that has been given to us in Mashiach, and this Brit Hadashah, which was re-expressed when Mashiach said, I tell you the truth, you know, until I leave, the counselor can't come. But once I leave, a counselor will come who will counsel you in all truth. But of course, we know now that the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, as it's called in the English, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Ruach, uh, turns out to be really, really a phenomenal thing, not just a spirit of truth, not just a spirit of counsel, not just a spirit of blessing, but a spirit of healing and a spirit of prophecy and a spirit of so many other things. And we can see now that the Ruach is beginning to work within our community. And within our community, I think we're going to see now that the community is going to uh, stop the senseless beating uh, of the fist on the table to enforce the idea that we're right and correct. Because of course, a huge horror is coming on the earth. And you know this horror expands every time we turn around. Um, you know, there is a great reset coming, and but it's not the reset that's been planned by the wicked among us. It's a reset that's been planned by Yah as he straightens out the ways of mankind and straighten it, he will do, and he will straighten it into a blessing for those who love him and for those who trust him, and for those who wait upon him. There is a blessing awaiting because he will direct you in the way of things and the path that you need to follow a path of life and not a path of death, a path of beauty and not a path of ugliness, a path of righteousness and not a path of wickedness, a path, a path with a covenant of life, not with a covenant of death, a path with the resurrection and not a covenant with the grave or Sheol. And so we're going to see that this covenant is going to be expressed to us and told to us tonight as we look through the scriptures, we're going to see what's being said, what has been said, and what is being said about the future, and what this means for us as a people. Because as we live out our lives here, we're going to see many things. For those of you who are living now, you're going to see many things in this upcoming year, this year and the next year. You're going to see many, many things transpire, many things, a changing in the whole world, a changing in the nation states, a changing in political alignment a changing in your status, 
a changing in the expectation of what it means to be alive on this earth, rather than just being consumers, getting in a line at a drive through in order to get a drink or some food, we're going to become people who are people of the land, an organic people, people of an organic response to life and an organic rhythm in an organic way. And it's going to be much, much similar to what took place in the Garden of Eden rather than what takes place in the Garden of Pavement or the, or the concrete jungle. Because this promise that we had in the concrete jungle and the promise that we had in the digital world is now becoming a bankrupt promise. It's becoming a very bankrupt promise. And the people who promised this, this uh, good future could not do so in an organic way. Rather, they had to do so in a way that accumulated debt. And the reason it accumulated debt is because it did not appear in the natural rhythm of life. It did not appear in the natural flow of life. It did not appear in the natural blessings of Yahweh. Rather, it was man-created devices and a man-built house. And when Yah does not build the house, the workmen labor in vain. And we are beginning to see that, that as the Western world has walked away from the ways of Yah, walked away from the commandments, walked away from the discipline that is found in scripture, and has walked into a do what thou wilt philosophy that abandoned the whole idea of Yah having a meaningful presence in our lives. We have created a Frankenstein now. We've created a Frankenstein monster in our society. We've created a Frankenstein monster in our infrastructure. We've created a Frankenstein monster in the way we live and in our cultural experience. And all of these things, because they are inconsistent and incompatible with nature and with an organic life, they are destined to die. They have no longevity. They have a very short throw frequency. It's like if, you know, if we sing a right frequency, Yum, um, this frequency can go on and on and on and on. And why? Because it's a consonant frequency in harmony that will bless the earth because it is a consonant frequency that is in harmony with that which is created. But if we scream, <laughs> this has no life whatsoever because it is a frequency that goes, right? That frequency is very short and very short-lived because it is the frequency of death. It is not the frequency of life. And so things that have been constructed, that were constructed outside the will of Yah, and that were constructed on the basis of man's uh, maniacal egoism, well, those things are going to have a very short life and do have a very short life. And so we see that in the 19th century, we rose out of a population whose means of travel, if you wanted to travel in this world on land, you traveled by horseback. And the train was not noticeably faster. It was a little bit faster, not noticeably. And of course, you would travel by boat, by steamship, by sail, by sailboat. But these were the fastest means of travel known on earth. Only in the 20th century do we arrive at flight. And so we've had flight with us for a little more than 100 years, and we've had this advanced technology for a little more than 50 years. And what has this brought to the world? Well, right now, it looks like, oh, well, we can do this, we can do that. We can have this meeting here tonight, for instance, thanks to the technology. However, this technology has a finiteness to it. And to try to say that we can replace the nefesh of Yahweh with an AI chip. We can replace the blessings of Yah with a computer code. We can replace the life that has been given to us in the breath in our nostrils with some kind of a uh, Android or some kind of a robot or some kind of a AGI synthetic being. The answer is no, we can't. The ideas are, uh, for lack of a better term, poppycock, they're nonsense. They have no meaning. But many of the people who have been seeking meaning in this digital world have sought to do this because they do not accept this concept that there is a life after death. They believe, well, this is what you get. My consciousness right now is all I get. And when my consciousness, when the organic substance 
that surrounds my consciousness, which is the beating heart and the breathing lungs, when this ends, my consciousness ends, I go into a dark bleakness of nothingness, and that's that. That's it. And so because they have no expectation of consciousness succeeding after their organic body dies, they are seeking now to find a find eternity and eternal life in some kind of singularity in artificial intelligence. Well, I will place my consciousness right into a android. I will place it into a cyborg. I'll have my consciousness built into the mind of some AI machine. They're saying that some of the proponents of this are saying that this will be achieved by the year 2045. Well, I suspect it's going to be achieved a lot sooner than that. The only difficulty is, is that, first of all, we know that in AI, the quantum computing that's going on right now, those computers are thinking one trillion times faster than the human mind. By the time you get to 2045, this is going to be the common paradigm among AGI devices. So as a consequence, you trying to place your mentality into one of these machines the machine is going to look at that and say, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like you trying to, you know, you, you having your consciousness, consciousness occupied with the brain of a squirrel. Why would you want to even entertain that in your brain at all? You would just extinguish it. Get rid of that. I don't want it here. Bye. But we think that our lives are so manifestly important that we have to put them in the machines and the machines are going to respect our August intelligence and our elite status on the earth. They won't. And that's if we get to that day, which we won't, because the machines have a definite lifespan, which will be over before then. So anyway, you see people who, because they deny the life after death that is given to us in the word, they're desperate to create an eternity on what they can do with their own hands. This fellow, Yoval Noah Harari, you know, there is no God. That's such a stupid notion. He believes. And that the thing is, we have replaced God because we are now gods that will create mankind in our image by interfacing mankind with the computers we have built. Now, this kind of maniacal egoism and psychopathy is just a pure derangement syndrome, in my opinion. And he represents, given this kind of thought that he believes that mankind can achieve gods and create man in their own image, he has become a wicked voice for death in the world. Well, if we can become our own gods, why do we need this group of useless eaters? This group of people who are going to expect a pension when they retire, when we've already spent their pension. This group of people who have an expectation that they have a right to life, that they can live and love and, and enjoy life on this planet. Who do these people think they are? Instead, Harari becomes the chief voice for death in the world, for death in the world. And he has given the intellectual background, he's created the intellectual soil into which the plant life of genocide and democide has grown. And it's premised upon this notion that, hey, we don't believe that there's life after death. Therefore, we must do everything we possibly can to sustain ourselves for as long as we can on this earth and then to sustain our consciousness somehow after we die in a perpetual machine. This is their thinking. Well, fortunately, we have something that is much nicer than that. We have the word of Yahweh, which preexisted all of them and their ancestors, which will not fail, which will not pass away. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word shall never pass away. So tonight, we look at the issue of life after death. Let's see what's written. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Neither does corruption. Et inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the shofar shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, 
and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal man must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, there's a whole bunch of things about this passage. I'm just going to jump into them quickly because we've got a lot to talk about tonight. But here's what we here's something that we have to say, right? Okay, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Now, whoa, hold on here a minute. I thought flesh and blood were created by Yah. They were. They were created on this earth. But flesh and blood cannot, cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Only incorruption can inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Very important. Now, when we look at this in terms of a universal perspective, if you have something that is inconsistent with the perfect plan, the perfection of what is there is going to expunge that imperfection. In other words, an eternal system cannot have something that is going to kill the eternal system. That can, it's not going to have a disease or a cancer or a plague or something else that can infect and destroy the eternal system. This is why whatever is going to exist in eternity is going to exist in perfection. It's going to exist in incorruption because you cannot have corruption in heaven. So when you see flesh and blood, flesh and blood dies. This is what we know on the earth. Flesh and blood perishes. And to as dust you were, to dust you shall return. And so as a consequence, this cannot be part of the eternal, uh, the eternal plan. The eternal plan can only have perfection within it, Okay. But death will be swallowed up in victory, according to Paul All's writing in 1 Corinthians 13. So when he says, behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Well, what does it mean to sleep? What's he talking about here? Well, here's the Greek word. It's koimau, koimau. Now, this is uh, Strong's G2837, which means to put to sleep. Oh, okay, sleep. All right, I got it. Passively or reflexively to slumber. Yeah figuratively to disease, to be asleep or to be dead. And this comes from kamai, a primary verb meaning to lie outstretched, which is consistent with both sleeping and being dead. Okay. We shall not all be dead, but we shall all be changed. Okay. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Now, this is from Genesis, Breshit, chapter 2, verse 21. Now, in the Ivrit, the word there is tardama, tardama, and which means lethargy, or by implication, trance, a deep sleep, right? Tardama. However, we see that this comes from the root radam, radam. So, for those of you who um, like our Hebrew teaching, let's do a little bit of an annotation here. We'll just quickly take a look. So we see the root here, radam. And so this means we have what? We have a tav prefix and we have a he suffix. So the he suffix is usually going to signify a feminine suffix, the feminine noun. And then we're going to see that the the tav as a prefix, this word, the tav as a prefix means that, you know, you shall, right? You shall, thou shalt, you shall, you shall sleep, you shall stupefy, you shall slumber. And radama is the, is the feminine plural, okay? So this is how we can see, we see here again, once again, our root radam, right? And here is Radam here, Radam, Radam. Okay. So when you see that, you can see that Radam has got a prefix and a suffix in this word Tardama. And it means to stun or to stupefy with sleep or death, to be fast asleep in a deep cast into a dead sleep, for instance. Well, this would be kind of important when you think about it, because why would it be important? Because he's about to, you know, close up. He's about to take up a portion of Adam and create a woman out of it, right? He's going he's gonna to pull out a portion of Adam. So you might think of it as kind of a, like an anesthesia, right? 
uh, you know, you're going to be out. And how far out was Adam when he took this section of Adam out and then created a, uh, a created woman from it? We know that the word for rib there is not, not really mean rib. It means like a portion, the side of, you know, some aspect of the man. How much a, a part of the man did he take out? We don't know. But we do know that this was going to be something radical, okay? And so this isn't the only time that we see uh, a sleep. Now, take a look at this. There's another word for sleep here that we find, which is, and Yaakov went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, in this case, again, we're talking about just sleeping. The Hebrew word there is the word shachav. Shachav, okay, H7901, which is a primitive root meaning to lie down for rest, okay, or to disease or to die, right? You can lie down for rest, or you can die, or for any other reason you might lie down. Shakab, right? So again, we have this same kind of idea. Well, we see, therefore, that in the Greek and in the Ivory, the term sleep has as one of its references to disease, to disease, to die, in both the Greek and in the Ivory, and in both terms in the Ivory. Okay, whether you're talking about Radam or Shakab, same thing. Okay. So now when we take a look in Yahweh Elohim caused upon the man and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Well, and this is the first instance when we see this Tardama, you can see that Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, given that a portion of the man was to be taken to create the woman. He wasn't just taking a nap, right? Rather, it was a deep sleep similar to or greater than being anesthetized, a near death state. Was Adam the only one that experienced this? Well, take a look at this. Here's another use of Tardama. This is from Breshith, chapter 15, uh, verses 12 through 15. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep, Tardama, fell upon Avram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Avram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a strange land, and that it is not theirs and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And you shall go to your fathers in peace and shall be buried in a good old age. Okay. So here we see in this second instance of Tardama, we see that Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Avram. And Avram perceived it as a great horror. Here, Yahweh speaks directly to Avram with a great prophecy. Now, some of you might know that in the, um, you might know that in the Sefer, uh, over at Sefer Publishing Group, we have additional books that you can read that are extra scriptural writings. And one of those is the book Breshith, Breshith which includes uh, in some of other writings that are consistent with the time of Moshe. One of those is the Apocalypse of Abraham, or the Testimony of Abraham. There's the Testimony of Moshe, the Apocalypse of Moshe, the Testimony of Abraham, which concerns this passage, and this passage in particular. It has a great prophetic reach to it, if you will, uh, discussing what happened with Abraham going to sleep here at this point, going into a deep sleep, a deep sleep that is accompanied with a prophetic vision, right? A prophetic vision. All right. Well. This other word that is found for sleep, right, shachav, which in some instances mean to be deceased, here is another passage looking at shachav in a similar way. Let's take a look at this, which is from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 12, concerning Yaakov. And Yaakov went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Shachav. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. Now, there are many people who believe that this was near Mount Hermon, Mount Hermon, because this is a place where the transfiguration took place. They call it Caesarea Philippi during the time of the New Testament. 
And this is the place where the book of Hanok says the watchers came through and fell and fell to the earth at Mount Hermon. And here we see he's having a vision of angels ascending and descending while he is in the condition of shakab, right? The word is shakab, which also means in some instances to be deceased. Well, let's look at the rest of this interface, which occurs when Yaakov was in shakab. And behold, Yahweh stood above the ladder and said, I am Yahweh Elohai of Abraham, your father, and the Elohai of Yitzhak, the land whereon you lie, to you will I give it, and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and ye shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and will guard you in all places whither you go, and will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done it, that which I have spoken to you of. Okay, fascinating, because remember that Yaakov would leave, and he would go up to Haran, and he would have obtain, uh, he thought he was going to obtain one wife, but instead he ends up with two wives and two concubines, who are going to give him 12 sons. And in these 12 sons, guess what? Is the land where you to you I will give it and to your seed, and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, the house of Yasharel. He's not named Yasharel yet, but he will be named Yasharel. And when he's named Yasharel, it is the seed of Yasharel, the 12 tribes. That is the subject of the phrase. When you bless Yasharel, you are blessed. When you curse Yasharel, you are cursed. It has nothing to do with the modern day nation state and has everything to do with the tribes of Yasharel, the 12 tribes of Yasharel, because he, Yahweh says in this, in you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, right? This is what is said, this is what is said, in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay, hallelujah, all right. Now, again, we're going to see Shakab, and we're going to see on Shakab, oh, one second, if you will, one second. I hope I'm still with you guys, that you're still with me. It looks like we're still going on. Sorry about that. Okay, um, let me double check here, make sure that we're, we're still functioning. Yeah, okay. One second. Okay. Are we still here? Are you guys still here? Can somebody put in the chat if you can still hear me? Okay. All right, good. We're still here. Okay, good. All right. Well, let's continue then. And I'll see if I can uh, keep this presentation going. We just had a little bit of a problem with the Zoom here is all. Okay. So with Shemuel, we see that an heir the lamp of Elohim went out in the temple. Okay, great. And can you can you guys still see the PowerPoint as well? Is, is the PowerPoint still functioning for you? Coming through loud and clear. Okay, thanks, Randall. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Okay. All right, good. Okay. All right. Yes, well, we, uh, blood of the Lamb Ministries. We'll get to we'll get to Jezebel here at the point, but here, but hang on here just a second. Okay, okay, good, good. So we're going to talk about Shakab now as to how this relates to uh, Samuel, right? And now here's this is a discussion that takes place in First Samuel in chapter three. And ere the lamp of Elohim went out in the temple of Yahweh where the Ark of Elohim was, and Shemuel was laid down to sleep. Shachab, 
right? That Yahweh called El Shemuel, and he answered, here am I. And he ran into Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down, and Yahweh called yet again, Shemuel. And Shemuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. And he answered, I called you not, my son, lie down again. Now, Shemuel did not yet know that Yahweh, neither was the word of Yahweh yet revealed unto him. And Yahweh called Shemuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. And Eli perceived that Yahweh had called the child. Therefore, Eli said unto Shemuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you shall say, speak, Yahweh, for your servant hears. So Shemuel went and lay down in his place, and Yahweh came and stood and called as at other times, Shemuel, Shemuel. Then Shemuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. So what we can see here is that with Shemuel, again, in a shakav, he is hearing the word of Yahweh in a shakav, right? And we saw that Yaakov, saw Yahweh at the top of the ladder and angels ascending and descending in Shakab. Okay, so take a look at what Job has to say about this issue. This is from Job chapter 7, Yov, Yov chapter 7. What is man that you should magnify him? Ah, there's a question. And that you should set your heart upon him and that you should visit him every morning and try him every moment. How long will you not depart from me, nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? I have sinned. What shall I do unto you, O preserver of men? Why have you set me as a mark against you so that I am a burden to myself? And why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now shall I sleep, Shachab, in the dust, and you shall seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. Now, here... You have very hard evidence, very important and very hard evidence right here. Shall I sleep in the dust? This is the use of shakav, very particularly and very specifically, to refer to dying, what we call dying, right? Yov is referring to his death as sleeping in the dust. That's how he's referencing it, sleeping in the dust. Okay. But man dies and wastes away. Yea, man gives up his ruach. And where is he? As the waters fail from the sea and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol that you would keep me secret until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. All right, now, we've got a pretty interesting circumstance here, okay? Because Yov is asking a question, a series of questions. But he is going to reveal to us something that is going to go on, okay? So first of all, he's telling us that man shall be asleep and shall not awaken, nor be raised till the heavens be no more. So again, we have this idea of man is going to awaken and man is going to, is going to be raised but it's not going to happen until we get to the end of things. They shall not awake, nor shall they be raised out of their sleep until we get to the end of things. So then Yov comes by and says, well, could, could would you hide me in Sheol that you would keep me secret? Now, again, we're going to see as we look into four Ezra that this profound silence is going to be upon us in Sheol until Yah's wrath has passed over. That you would appoint me a set time. There is an appointed set time for the resurrection, and Yov will be remembered. If a man dies, shall he live again? Well, 
a man dies and he shall live again. And all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. Okay. So we see what? They shall not awaken nor be raised until the appointed time when the change comes. Does Paul contradict this? Does Paul contradict this? I don't think so. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Yahweh, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their grain and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for you, Yahweh, only make me dwell in safety. Now, again, we're going to see the use of the word shakab here in this Psalm of David. And I think it's something quite interesting because he's saying, I will lay me down in peace, right? I will rest in peace and sleep, shakab, for you, Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. Dwell in safety as the wrath of Yahweh passes over mankind, passes over creation, passes over the earth, passes over the firestorm that will eventually you know, consume all of the earth. And after this takes place, we will still be safely sleeping and dwelling in safety in peace, in sleep, until Yahweh wakes us. So I wanted to show you just a couple of things on the Eve reading here, because you can see, okay, so here you see he opens up this passage with ba shalom, shalom, right? Which all of this stuff here, I will both lay me down. Actually, the verse starts with in peace, I will lay me down, right? And so yah, yahda, right? Esh chava. Now, Esh Chava, I, I, I highlighted this for you so you could see that right here is the root of the word, Shachab. We get a different Masoretic pronunciation because of all these Shvaz and stuff down here, but the you can see the root, Shachab, is right here. This makes the Aleph a prefix and the He a suffix. So this particular pronominal suffix is a pronominal suffix, meaning the feminine mind. And then this aleph right here is I will, right? The aleph presupposing shachav, I will. The tav presupposing the word, you shall. The aleph presupposing, I will. So what's it say? I will, right? I will sleep, right? I will sleep. And so, and so I show it here as the, here you see the mesh pronounce, mesh, uh, Meseratic pronunciation, esh chaba, esh chaba, but you can see the shachab is right there disguised by the pronunciation, okay? All right. So I will rest in peace and sleep. Where will I, where I will dwell in safety? <clears throat> well, is this supported in another scripture? Let's see. Okay, we're going to jump into our favorite passage, everybody's favorite passage. I'm speaking hypothetically. In 4 Ezra, 4 Ezra, chapter 7, the 70 verses. Okay, beginning in verse 36, then the pit of torment shall appear and opposite shall be the place of rest. And the furnace of Sheol shall be disclosed and opposite the paradise of delight. Okay, so we see here, Two things. We got the pit of torment, and it's a pit, and it's also a furnace, the furnace of Sheol. Okay. Then opposite is the place of rest. Oh, okay. And the paradise of delight. Okay. So here you see paradise in an Old Testament piece. We don't see paradise in any other book in the Tanakh, but we see it here in Ezra. It's interesting. Because is there a word paradise in the Ivrit? Well, yeah, there is. But first, let's take a look at the Greek. Look at the Greek word here. The Greek word, so we see, first of all, we see Sheol, right? So the furnace of Sheol, 
And so with the furnace of Sheol here, we'll take, let's take a look at Sheol. What's it say? Hades, the world of the dead, as if a subterranean retreat. Now, we've had long discussions about this at the Friday Fellowship, talking about whether or not there are the demons and the devils, as described in the book of Hanok, are they in fact trapped inside the inner earth? Instead of being in some dimension in the second heaven or some other place, but in fact, they're trapped inside a subterranean retreat that is called Hades or Sheol. Now, when you think about that, this subterranean retreat, right? And there's all kinds of discussion, whether you're talking about Admiral Byrd and the fleet of ships that he took to Antarctica that were disturbed by craft coming out of the water at high speeds that they'd never seen before. Or you're talking about these open pits in Siberia somewhere that where they come up to the pit, it seems to have a bottomless feature to it. And they hear screaming and yelling coming out of it. And, uh, you know, there's a, a number of, shall we say, uh, wives tales, for lack of a better word, that discuss these kinds of things. And, you know, and when we hear about them, what well, we can call them, we can call them wives tales if we want, but it's looking like there is something here. There is something here, subterranean retreat, shield, that this may be, in fact, the furnace. Now, we know, we know for a fact that there is some pretty hot stuff under the crust of the earth. I mean, when you see a volcano erupt, at least a, a lava producing volcano, you see all of a sudden this hot molten lava coming out that is that's screaming hot, right? And we know that that exists beneath the surface. How far beneath the surface, we don't know. We also know water is under there. We know oil is under there. But there appear to be some places that are hot and screaming hot subterranean retreat, right? A furnace. Is it a furnace? That's a question. Okay. Now, this comes from the word Sha'al, Sheol, which is a primitive root meaning to inquire, to request, or to demand. Now, there are a lot of people who have made hay out of the fact that Sha'ul, the first king of Israel, and also Sha'ul, the name of Paul, has the same spelling as Sheol. Well, okay, yeah, but you have to remember that in oftentimes in Hebrew, there's what's called contronyms. All right, but now what about paradise? We have this word paradise here. What about paradise? Is there a paradise in the Ivrit? Well, yeah, there is. And the word is pardes, pardes, pardes. This is Hebrews 6508, strong 6508, pardes, a word of foreign origin, meaning an orchard or forest. And in its application, I think the three verses where it appears, it's referring to an orchard, okay? not necessarily a forest. Now, I'll give you some examples of some of those verses right here. So here's one from Kohelet or Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 5. I made me gardens and orchards, pardes, and I planted trees in, all, uh, in them of all kinds of fruits. Now, gardens, of course, are gan, you know, ganim, gan, ganim, and orchards, pardes. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. Well, what else do we find here? We find also in Shir Hashirim, or the Song of Solomon, right? Um, a garden is latched, my sister, my bride, the surrounding pool is latched, and the spring is sealed. Your plants are an orchard, pardes, of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, henna blossoms with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, reed and cinnamon, with all woods of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, with all taps of aromatics or tops of aromatics, a spring of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams flowing from Lebanon. Well, it sounds absolutely beautiful. Sounds absolutely beautiful. Pardes, right? Now, we also know, we haven't talked about it here, but there is, in the Ivrit, there is an analytic that's called pardes, right? You know, Pashat Rez Dorash Sod. And it is a methodology of looking at uh, and, and a methodology of understanding or analyzing the Hebrew. It's a form of exegesis, if you will, a common Hebrew exegesis of scripture called the pardes. But in this case, we see a word pardes, and it's referring to an orchard. And where it appears here, it's a beautiful orchard. All right. Okay, good. Well, let's see if we have anything in the, in anything else. Well, here we go. Let's take a look at this. We're going to see paradise show up again in the New Testament. 
And one of the criminals which were hanged railed on him, saying, If you be Hamashiach, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear Elohim, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Yahusha Adonai, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yahusha said unto him, Amen, I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Well, okay, paradise. So what does this mean? Does this mean that when we die, we're immediately in heaven? Let's take a look and see if we can explore this a little bit. Because we have a Greek word here that is kind of, you know, conspicuous, shall we say. Paradesos. Paradesos. Oh, excuse me. Paradesos. This is Greek 3857. And it is a word of oriental origin. But in the Strong's, it tells you, compare it with H6508, pardes, the word we just looked at. Why? Because the meaning is park, a park, especially an Eden, like a garden, a place of future happiness, paradise, paradise, you see? So it too points to this idea of a park or a garden, right? A park or a garden. Same kind of thing, paradesos. As, as well as pardes, both words have kind of similar uh, structure, similar pronunciation, and they both mean the same thing. Okay, here's another discussion about paradise. Paul's going to give, try to give us a little bit closer to it, but this is out of 2 Corinthians, a book most likely written by Luke, you know, Lucius. Okay, and so here's how it reads in chapter 12. I knew a man in Mashiach above 14 years ago whether in body I cannot tell, or whether out of body I cannot tell. Elohim knows. Such one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Elohim knows. How that he was caught up into paradise, you know, paradisos, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, of course, for me, this is kind of confusing, because I'm not quite sure which which utterance he would have heard in heaven that would be unlawful for him to utter, other than there, there are words that were spoken in heaven that said, seal these up and do not speak them, seal them up and do not speak them. Okay, but here we have paradise being referenced as the third heaven. And if you recall, Paul, Paul was gone for 14 years, right? After his experience on the road to Damascus, he left and was gone for 14 years before he returned to become a missionary, gone for 14 years, returns to become a missionary. So he's referring to something that occurred on the road uh, to Damascus around that time. So I knew a man in Mashiach about, uh, about 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. Well, okay, all right. Uh, obviously a mysterious passage. We don't have it all laid out here, but he is claiming that he was caught up into paradise, paradesos, which is the equivalent of the third heaven. All right, let's see if this is going to change our understanding of the resurrection and the life and what is going on with those of us, uh, who, you know, who need to, who want to know, right? Okay, so let's take a look at, again, going back into Ezra 7, Ezra chapter 7. And so beginning in verse 29, after these years shall my son Mashiach die, and all men that have life. Well, okay. Now, this is a huge passage. After these years shall my son Mashiach die. This was an unacceptable passage to the rabbis, and this is why the book of Ezra, of second Ezra, Ezra Rebbe E, was excluded from the Tanakh, because the rabbis could not accept the fact that the Mashiach would die. That's not possible. It's not in the equation. And all men that have life. So in other words, death isn't going to be extinguished from the world, okay? And the world shall be turned into the old silence for seven days. Now, seven days, of course, you know, when we look at, as, at Ezekiel 4, 5 and 4, 6, we know a day is equal to a year, like as in the former judgment. So this is referring to a day equals a year, so that no man shall remain. And after seven days, the world that yet awakens not 
shall be raised up and that shall die and, and that shall die that is corrupt. And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her and so shall the dust those dwell in silence and the secret places shall deliver those souls that were committed unto them. And El Elyon shall appear upon the seat of judgment and misery shall pass away and the long suffering shall have an end. But judgment only shall remain, truth shall stand and faith shall wax strong and the work shall follow and the work shall follow and the reward shall be showed and the good deeds shall be a force, and wicked deeds bear no rule. Now, one passage I didn't put in here, which I probably should have, you know, who knows, right? Uh, I probably should have put in this passage talking about uh, the dead rising or the, the death of Mashiach. All right, let me see here. Somebody's got a question in here. Um, and uh, let me see if I can find this question. <laughs> okay, maybe I can't find it. All right. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, there's some good, there's some good uh, scriptures being put up here. Yahushua went into the lower parts, now that he ascended, what is it, that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's a good point. Yeah. And again, I mean, we've got a lot of slides here tonight, and I couldn't get to all of them, but I have some of them here. Okay, and we'll come back to, um, we'll come back to the, um, the question, okay, when we get to it. All right, so let's continue. So when we talk about this seven-day period, a day equal to a year, well, this is kind of reminds us of what's going on in Daniel when we look at Daniel 9. So it's after these years shall my son Mashiach die and all men have life, and the world shall be turned into the old silence for seven days, like as in former judgment, so that no man shall remain. Well, okay. Well, the prophecy in Daniel 9.27 and the strength of the covenant multiplies for one week. Now, that would be seven days, right? One week, seven days. And in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation cease. And upon the end, abominations destroy until the, combination, the, the consummation is determined and poured out of the desolation. Now, take a look at this prophecy for just a minute. Because we have a seven day, we got seven days here, seven days. And in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation cease. Well, we know that with the sacrifice of Mashiach, the blood sacrifices and the oblation of animal sacrifice came to a screeching halt. That was the end of it. And upon the end of this period, upon the end of this period, abominations will destroy. Well, what period? Well, you're talking about a 70-year period, right? Because if you recall, the, the uh, temple is, is assaulted in 68 AD and finished in 70 AD, but it's burned initially in 68 AD. And abominations destroy until the consummation is determined and poured out over the desolation. So you have a desolation, and then you have a consummation on top of that, right? All of which occurs in a 70-year period. And the strength of the covenant is multiplying but in the middle of the week, Mashiach is sacrificed. And when we're talking about the middle of the week, we're talking about a day is equal to a year. So a day being equal to a year, then this is a seven-year period. So consider the death of Mashiach in AD 27. Now, I used to proclaim that the death was in AD 28. But having finally reconciled Matthew 28, 1, I now believe that the death was in 27 AD, and that the crucifixion took place on a Tuesday, took place on a Tuesday. And so when you talk about, uh, when you talk about the middle of the week, of course, you're talking about, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, that's the first three days, followed by Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that would be the second half of the days, right? And so he was entombed at exactly the halfway point. And so, so if we talk about that, in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation came to a halt because of the sacrifice of Mashiach. Then we know that the Ruach HaKodesh, it's reported by the rabbis, disappeared from the temple in 31 AD. That was the year they tried to put the red ribbon around the Azazel goat, and which would traditionally turn white. And this year, it didn't do it. That's when they knew that the Ruach HaKodesh had left the building, which was three and a half years later. 
So if he was de- if he died in 27 AD at Pesach, three and a half years later is going to be Yom Kippur in 30, 31 AD, assuming a ministry of 3.5 years. And of course, that's you know anathema to Michael Rood's teaching, who believes it was only 18 months. But I don't believe that. I think the, I think the teaching was I think the the ministry total. And you know, when you you know, when you calculate these dates, you know, you have to go back to okay, when did Mashiach get called to begin this ministry, right? It it goes back to before he called his disciples, which means it goes all the way back to his baptism with John the Baptist. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so we're going to drop back into Ezra again to see if we can discover what goes on after death. Then the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite shall be the place of rest, and the furnace of Sheol shall be disclosed, and the opposite the paradise of delight. Then El Elyon will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead. So this is going to be a speech that's given upon the resurrection. Look now and understand whom ye have denied, whom ye have not served, whose commandments ye have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment, a day that has no sun or moon or stars, or cloud or thunder or lightning or wind or water or air or darkness or evening or morning, or summer or spring or heat or winter or frost or cold or hail or rain or dew, or noon or night or dawn or shining or brightness of light, but only the splendor of the glory of El Elyon by which all shall see what has been determined for them. For it will last for about a week of years, seven years. This is my judgment and its prescribed order. And to you alone have I shown you these things. Okay. All right. All right. Now, I'm going to talk about just a couple of things here before we leave this slide, which is that, okay. Okay. So he's going to say, okay, what? These are the nations have been raised from the dead. Look now and, un- and understand, okay, one whom ye have denied. That's premise number one. Whom ye have not served. That's premise number two. Whose commandments you have despised. That's premise number three. And for these reasons, these three reasons, you're going to be looking at Sheol and the furnace. You're not going to be looking at the place of rest and the paradise of delight for those three reasons, okay? It's a little bit obscure, but it's good to see it. Now, Ezra is going to is going to protest, right? Listen now to Ezra's cry and, and ask yourself if this is not our cry, right? Oh, earth, what have you brought forth if the mind is made out of the dust like the other created things? For it would have been better if the dust itself had not been born so that the mind might not have been made from it. But now the mind grows with us, and therefore we are tormented because we perish and we know it. Let mankind lament, but let the beasts of the field be glad. Let all who have been born lament, but let the four-footed beasts and the flocks rejoice. For it is much better with them than with us, for they do not look for a judgment, nor do they know of any torment or Yeshua promised to them after death. For what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive, but cruelly tormented? For all who have been born are involved in iniquities and are full of sins and burdened with transgressions. And if we were not to come into judgment after death, perhaps it would have been better for us. Now, this is a critical question, I think, that goes to all of us. Because when you think about this, the animals, they live, they do live a life of bliss, and thank goodness, right? I mean, you know, my dog is just fat, dumb, and happy. Well, she's not that fat, but she's definitely dumb and happy. And, you know, as are other animals, right? And they live their life. And then one day they, they come to their end of their life and they die. And that's that. And there's no fear of judgment. They're not tormented by this because they have no concept of the knowledge of good and evil. But we who have consciousness, who speak and who articulate with the idea of the spoken word, Now we're in a completely different situation because we understand, we know, and we have the wisdom to be able to determine that we have the knowledge of Yahweh, 
You know, it's one of the things about that passage about they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the tree of my knowledge of good and evil, right? Da'ati, my knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the tree of my knowledge of good and evil. And so as a consequence, we rose above living a life like, like a common beast, as Ezra is talking about here, because we were given a mind, right? He says he's calling it the mind. The mind might have not have been made from it. The consciousness might not have been made of it. You know, as Descartes said, I stink, therefore I am. You know, consciousness sits here and the consciousness that exists allows us to conceptualize, to reason, to, to garner abstraction. And as we do this kind of thing, we quickly discover at a very early age that we are finite beings, that none of us will escape the life in the flesh alive, that we have to contemplate the fact that we will die. You know, I had a history prof that once said, you know, if you're not killed by trauma, somebody shooting you or you dying in a car wreck or falling off a cliff or having a bungee cord break on you or something to this effect, then you, then you get to contemplate how you're going to die for long periods of time. Right. So this is the kind of the difference, if you will, that we contemplate death. We we recognize what he is saying here. Right. That, you know, we are we're here to lament. Right. We lament because unlike the beasts of the field who do not know, we do know. And so the question is, Ezra is asking a question. Why? Why did you create us with a consciousness if what this consciousness is, is going to be eternal and we're going to be tormented forever, right? Now, answer, Yah answered him and said, when El Elyon made the world and Adam, all who have, and all who have come from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. And now understand from your own words, for you have said, that the mind grows with us. For this reason, therefore, those who dwell on the earth shall be tormented because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity. Though they received the commandments, they did not guard them. And though they obtained the Torah, they dealt unfaithfully with what they had received. What then will they have to say in the judgment? Or how will they answer in the last times? For how long the time is that El Elyon has been patient with those who inhabit the world, and not for their sakes, but because of the times which he has foreordained. A very important understanding here. The times aren't about us. The times have all been foreordained. Yah knows what the progression is going to be of mankind, how many years mankind is going to be around, what the cycles of mankind's reasoning are, what the cycles of mankind's faith are, what man is going to do, how, how soon wickedness will arise to unprecedented levels that cannot be stopped. All of these things he has a very clear understanding of. We don't, but he does. And he foreordained it for his benefit to sort wheat from the tares. And what he is saying here is that Torment is reserved for those who had the opportunity but rejected it. Though they had understanding, they nonetheless committed iniquity. Though they received the commandments, they figured out a way to justify themselves from keeping them. And though they obtained the Torah, they didn't, they, even though they were, this was given to them, they weren't faithful to it at all. Eh, forget about it. We're going to follow the Ashtaroth poll. We're going to follow Buddhism. We're going to follow something else. We're going to follow anything else but that stuff. Anything else but that. Okay. I answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, O Yahweh, show this also to your servant, whether after death, as soon as everyone yields up his soul, we shall be kept in rest until those times come when you will renew the creation or whether we shall be tormented at once. Now, again, we have a big question here, right? Will we be kept in rest, right? Or will we be tormented? These are the questions. All right. Well, let's see what he says. He's got something to say for that. Now concerning death, the teaching is, when the decisive decree has gone forth from El Elyon that a man shall die, 
Now, consider that for a second, my friends. There's lots of things we can do, accidents and other things that can happen. But the odd news, the days of our lives, the minutes of our lives, the seconds of our life, the nanosecond of our life. And when he puts out a decisive decree that a man shall die, well, then that's when it's going to happen. And as the Ruach leaves the body to return again to him who gave it, the Ruach, the spirit, as the breath leaves the body to return to him who gave it. First of all, happens. And of those who have, and have not guarded the way of El Elyon and who have despised his Torah and who have hated those who fear Elohim, such Ruachot shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, ever grieving and sad in seven ways. Okay, now here we are back to the list and let's see what we have. First, those who show scorn Two, those who have not guarded the way of El Elyon. Three, those who have despised his Torah. And four, those who have hated those who fear Elohim. Now, we know we've had some people with some extremely loud mouths over this last two years who wanted to put believers in El Elyon in concentration camps. Are you guys, can I, somebody, would somebody signal to me that they're hearing me? Okay, let's see, let me get down here and say, okay. You have no sound, okay. Let me try this again and see if I, I get microphone. There we go, I think I'm. Microphone now, okay. All right, my mic is working again. Okay, it's working. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I don't know what's going on. I got a, I've got all kinds of bugs working in the machine. Okay, all right, good. All right, so let me go back here and let's talk about this again, this particular verse. I'm going to pick it up here. You can see that the, the what is going to cause judgment is this. If you are one of those who have shown scorn, that's one. You have not guarded the way of El Elyon, that's two. If you have despised his Torah, that's three. And who have hated those who fear Elohim. Now, yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'll tell you, I've got, there's a real bug in the machine here today. I got to tell you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You got to, you got, you got up to go to concentration camps. Okay. Yeah, concentration camps. Well, that's what they were proposing. Concentration camps, that this is where we should go. Because we were the problem. We had, uh, we had done horrible things by not following the sorcerers and instead following the Torah. We were the problem. They don't think that anymore because now they're realizing that following the sorcerers has followed them into death. Okay. Now let's continue here. One second. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, difficulties I'm having today. All right. Okay. So these are the seven ways that you're going to see what happens to those who go into torment? Okay. I see H. I hear you, HG. The first way, because they have scorned the Torah of El Elyon. The second way, because they cannot now make a good repentance that they may live. Very important teaching. Once you've arrived at this point, you cannot repent. The third way, they shall see the reward laid up for those who have trusted the covenants of Elohim. The fourth way, they shall consider the torment laid up for themselves in the last days. The fifth way, they shall see how the habitations of the others are guarded by angels in profound quiet, right? This is rest in peace, right? This is what David was talking about. I shall find peace 
and I shall dwell in quiet. I shall dwell safely. I shall rest in profound quiet. The angels shall guard this. The sixth way, they shall see how some of them will pass over into torments. The seventh way, which is worse than all the ways that have been mentioned, because they shall utterly waste away in confusion and be consumed with shame and shall wither with fear at seeing the glory of El Elyon before whom they sinned while they were alive and before whom they are to be judged in the last times. So again, we have to see, we have to see this very clearly that this idea of showing scorn, of, of disavowing the Torah, of oppressing those who fear El Elyon, and, you know, this whole idea of this arrogance, the denial and walking contrary to the way that Yah has taught, this is going to result in judgment. All right. But now, this is the order of those who have guarded the ways of El Elyon when they shall be separated from their mortal body. During the time that they lived in, they laboriously served El Elyon and withstood danger every hour that they might guard the Torah of the Torah giver perfectly. Therefore, this is the teaching concerning them. First of all, they shall see with great joy the glory of him who receives them, for they shall have rest in seven orders. Okay, let's see. The first order, because they have striven with great effort to overcome the evil thought which was formed with them, that it might not lead them astray from life into death. Yeah, well, now this is a big thing, this evil thought, right? We talk about it in the Our Father prayer, right? Lead us not into the evil inclination. Keep us from the evil inclination. The evil inclination that lies within us, the evil thought that lies within us, which is what? You too can be a God, right? You too can be a God. Well, no, you don't want to be led away from life into the covenant with death. Instead, you strive with a great effort to overcome that evil thought. In the second order, because they see with the perplexity in which the souls of the wicked wander and the punishment that awaits them. Uh-oh, look, you can see it. The third order, they see the witness which he who formed them bears concerning them, that while they were alive, they guarded the Torah, which was given them in trust. And again, here we're talking about a fiduciary duty, right? And this fiduciary duty, I want to kind of spend a second on this. And we talk about a fiduciary duty. We're talking about an enhanced duty. It's not just yes or no. When you when someone is give, when someone gives you something in trust, you have a fiduciary duty to handle that in trust. It's an enhanced duty to do your very best, not just to do, but to do your very best. We have a fiduciary duty to guard the Torah of Yahweh. Okay. The fourth order, they understand the rest which they now enjoy being gathered into their chambers and guarded by angels in profound quiet and the glory which awaits them in the last days. Because when you're, when you're guarded by angels in profound quiet, you're asleep, you sleep. And you don't wake because it's a profound quiet. You sleep and you don't wake, which means I'll finally get a good night's rest. Okay, hallelujah. But you sleep in a profound quiet and you do not waken. When you wake, you will waken to the last days. That's when you will awaken, not before. The fifth order, they rejoice that they have now escaped what is corruptible and shall inherit what is to come. The incorruptible, just like Paul said, you shall... Escape the corruptible, and you shall inherit the incorruptible. Besides, they see the straits and toil from which they have been delivered, and the spacious liberty which they are to receive and enjoy in immortality. The sixth order, when it is shown to them how their face is to shine like the sun, and how they are to be made like the light of the stars, being incorruptible from then on. Now, you see where Paul got the phrase that. You will, you, will be, you will shed the corruptible and you will take on the incorruptible. You see where he got that? You see where, where, where Paul found that phrase to, get, to deliver to us in 1 Corinthians? Where did he find it? He was a second witness to the first witness, which is Ezra, telling us right here. 
you will escape the corruptible. You will escape the straits and the toil from which we have been delivered, and you will enjoy spacious liberty in immortality, being incorruptible from then on. The seventh order, which is greater than all that have been mentioned, because they shall rejoice with boldness and shall be confident without confusion and shall be glad without fear. For they hasten to behold the face of him whom they served in life and from whom they are to receive their reward when glorified. This is the order of the souls of the righteous as henceforth announced. And the aforesaid are the ways of torment, which those who would not give heed shall suffer here and after. Well, I mean, it's a stern warning. It's a very stern warning. But I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to show you this so we can see. Now, let's take a look and see what are the scriptures we see to support this notion and how this is dealt with in the NT or the Brit Chadashah. So from the book of Hanok, Hanok is going to say something quite similar. This is in chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. From there, I proceeded to another spot where I saw on the west a great and lofty mountain, a strong rock, and four delightful places. Internally, it was deep, capacious, and very smooth, as smooth as if it had been rolled over. It was both deep and dark to behold. Then Raphael, one of the holy angels who were with me, answered and said, These are the delightful places where the rule quote, the souls of the dead, will be collected. For them, were they formed, and here will be collected all the souls of the sons of men. These places in which they dwell shall they occupy until the day of judgment and until their appointed period. You remember Job talked about his appointed period, right? His appointed time. Their appointed period will be long even until the great judgment. And I saw the rule code of the sons of men who were dead, and their voices reached to heaven while they were accusing. Now, Hanok is going to continue on. At that time, therefore, I inquired respecting him and respecting the general judgment, saying, why is one separated from another? And he answered, three separations have been made between the rule code of the dead, and thus have the rule code of the righteous been separated, namely by a chasm, by water, and by light above it. And in the same way, likewise, are sinners separated when they die and are buried in the earth, judgment not overtaking them in their lifetime. Here their souls are separated. Moreover, abundant is their suffering until the time of the great judgment, the castigation, and the torment of those who, were, who eternally execrate and whose souls are punished and bound there forever. Now, here you have a very clear reference with Hanok saying, this group of sinners, judgment, uh, there's a group of sinners that judgment did not overtake them in their lifetime. Now, woe unto these who have not been chastened by Yah in their lifetime, because they will stand to face his wrath, right? They will stand to face his wrath rather than, uh, you know, rather than being judged in this lifetime and being chastened in this lifetime. They have reserved unto themselves torment. And Hanok goes on to say, and thus has it been formed from the beginning of the world. Thus has there existed a separation between the souls of those who utter complaints and of those who watch for their destruction to slaughter them in the day of sinners. A receptacle of this sort has been formed for the souls of unrighteous men and of sinners, of those who have completed crime, and associated with the impious whom they resemble. Their souls shall not be annihilated in the day of judgment, neither shall they arise from this place. Then I blessed Elohim and said, Blessed be my Adonai, Yahweh of glory and of righteousness, who reigns over all forever and ever. Hmm. Okay. Well, is this consistent? What we just read in Hanok, is this consistent with this concept of Abraham's bosom? Well, let's take a look at Abraham's bosom. It's a, it's a story that is related in the Gospel of Luke, or the Bessara Lucas, in chapter 16. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Sheol, 
he lifted up his eyes being in torments. See, all these, all these words sound familiar now, don't they? Because we, we've been hearing about torment from Ezra. We've been hearing about it from Job. We've been hearing about it throughout this discussion. Sheol, he lifted up his eyes being in torments and saw Abraham afar off and Eleazar in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Eleazar that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and likewise Eleazar evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf, a chasm, right? Fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from, from thence. So here we see in the New Testament, testifying again to a chasm, a great gulf, as Enoch told us previously, right? Okay. But let us now consider the nature of the resurrection. So this is from Matthew Tiahu, chapter 22. That same day came to him the, the Sadokim, the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Rabbi, Moshe said, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his woman and raise up his seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a woman, deceased, and having no issue, left his woman unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And the last of all the women died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose woman shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, of course, this is, you know, I don't know, I would call it ludicrous, except that we have this very testimony in the book of to Tobiah, right? That uh, uh, Asmodeus, killed all seven of her, all seven of the husbands or the brothers that was supposed to marry her. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose woman shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Yahusha answered and said unto them, ye do err. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of Elohim. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in, marry, in marriage, but are as the angels of El in heaven, neither male nor female, right? But consider the nature of the resurrection. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by Elohim, saying, I am the Elohim of Abraham and the Elohim of Yitzhak and the Elohim of Yaakov. Elohim is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at this doctrine. Of course, because he expressed this as a direct quote from the Torah of Moshe which the Sadducees had missed. Now, he said, there's another answer to this very same question that's related out of the Gospel of Luke, or the Besorah Lucas. This is from Luke chapter 20. And Yahusha answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of Elohim, the Beni Elohim, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moshe showed at the thorn bush when he calls Yahweh the Elohim of Abraham and the Elohim of Yitzhak and the Elohim of Yaakov, for he is not an Elohim of the dead, but an Elohim of the living, for all live unto him. Mm, very good. In the Gospel of John, Yohanan, chapter 5, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. A huge word, right? Huge word. He who hears my word and believes on him who sent me. Amen, amen, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of Elohim, and they that hear shall live. For as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the son of Adam. 
marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Mm. And again, in Yochanan, one of my favorite passages, this is from chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, the Besorah Yochanan. Then said Martha unto Yavisha, Adonai, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of Elohim, Elohim will give it to you. And Yahushua, Yahushua said unto her, your brother, your brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Yahushua said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? All right, now this is a, a, a huge passage. But when we talk about this passage, we see that he doesn't say that you're going to immediately be in heaven. He just says, you shall, you shall live, you shall never die. And of course, this is a promise for life eternal, right? But when we look at what's given to us in the book of Revelation, Kizion, we see something here, right? Which is saying what? This is Kizion, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahusha and for the word of Elohim, right? Just what Yahusha was just talking about. If you have my words and you believe in Elohim, then you have eternal life, right? And the souls that were beheaded for the word of Elohim and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, they lived and reigned with Mashiach a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of Elohim and of Mashiach and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So we see the first resurrection, there is a first resurrection. And this first resurrection, right? This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is those that were beheaded for their witness. They're going to reign with Mashiach for a thousand years into the millennial reign. That's the first resurrection. Now there will be a second resurrection as well. And the second resurrection is where all the dead will rise. Okay, so now let us return to Shaul's word, Paul's world, word. This is from Quarantine Rishon or 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Neither does corruption et inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the shofar shall sound, and the dead be raised incorruptible. The exact language from 4 Ezra. And we shall be changed. What Job was waiting for, the change. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Again, language from 4 Ezra. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah and amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, this concludes our presentation on life after death here with Sefer Academy. And I want to thank you all for joining me for this presentation. And we've got a few minutes to take some questions. And I promise I'm not going to go on a rant and rave about flat earth. Okay, so we know that's not going to happen. Okay, very good.
All right, so let's see if we can take some questions here concerning what we've talked about tonight, okay? Uh, let's see. Yeah, the living water is something given to them. Yeah, so many good points. I know there's been many, many good points uh, made in the chat here tonight. And um, hold on one second. There we go. Okay, how about those that were alive at the resurrection and changed? They are not dead, but alive. Yes, this is this is true that when we see this rising of, you know, we will all be changed and corrupt when we're coming out of the grave, right? That when we rise out of the grave, first those come out of the grave and then the rest of us are lifted up into the heavens in this resurrection, incorruptible. Our bodies will be changed, right? That's a great question, Mark. And I think that does come to the, again, we have, that's the testimony of Paul, right? Okay. So Jessica says, put your questions in all caps. That's so going to help. Okay. Yeah, so it shall not enter heaven, it shall immediately wander about in torments, ever grieving and sad in seven ways. Yeah. And yeah, what does this mean? Well, I just, when I talked about this blood of the lamb ministries, I talked about what they're going to, they, they shall not enter into habitations. They're not going to enter into, you know, a, a, a place where they're going to rest in peace. They're not going to enter into that. Instead, they're going to wander the face of the earth. And now we see this, actually, you can see evidence of this. If you ever go to like a battlefield like uh, Gettysburg or other battlefields, or sometimes you can go to cemeteries, you can also see it, but you know, they, they call them poltergeists. But you see, you know, people will say, well, this house is haunted. Well, it probably is haunted. There probably is the soul of someone who did not enter into any habitation where they're resting in peace with an angel guarding them in profound silence, but rather they're wandering the face of the earth with an ever, you know, with an ever debilitating consciousness, their consciousness fades, they become more and more confused. And eventually they have very little thinking left at all. And you see this, there's plenty of evidence of this talking about, you know, a uh, poltergeist that maybe have occupied a house for so many years, can't find its way out of the corner of the bedroom, or can't find its way out of this or can't find its way out of that, because they're confused and lost. And so yeah, this is, um, yeah, they wander about in torment. That's what it means. They will not enter into habitations. They will not enter that into that place where they sleep in profound silence. Instead, they wander. And then they experience the seven things that we talked about there in Ezra. Okay, let's see. Hey, thank you guys. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this. Um, the first resurrection only includes the saved. No, the first resurrection includes only those who have been beheaded for their witness of the testimony of Mashiach and the word of Elohim. That those are the people who are going to be resurrected and they will be resurrected to live and rule with Mashiach for a thousand years. The others who, who may believe, may have had the testimony of Mashiach, may have believed in the word of Elohim, but they just died. They're not beheaded. They will sleep for a thousand years until we get to the second resurrection. And then they will be joining everyone else who's ever died in the second resurrection. Okay. Okay. So Judith asks a question. Is it okay to be incinerated rather than buried in the ground? Okay. Now, Judith, this is a great question. We've had lots of discussion about this in, um, we've had lots of discussion about this in, in the Sabbath group. And there is a passage, I think it's Hosea 2.1 that says, no, it's Amos 2.1 that says this one particular group of people were judged because they burned the bones of the king in the lime. And so hmm, maybe we're not supposed to be incinerated. Now we've talked about, you know, the gospels give us a very, uh, very good methodology for dealing with the dead, very clear how they did it. And it was a practice that still makes sense today. In fact, it makes more sense than what we've been doing, which is that instead of, you know, in the modern world, you've got two things going on. One, one is the problem that, gee, we got all these bodies. What are we going to do with them? Well, everybody wants to be buried. Okay, well, that means what? It means a full-length coffin, which is bigger than the body. The coffin goes in the ground, takes up the space, can't have anything above it. Therefore, you have coffins that are stacked up in these graveyards fill up dramatically. I mean, they really fill up. Like when you get into Europe, like Paris or Rome or something like this, you have bodies on bodies on bodies on bodies on bodies. In the UK, the person who introduced cremation was a Druid priest in Wales who said it's proper to be cremated. But this was a pagan practice and it, was not, uh, it wasn't the practice of the church. He said, oh no, you have to keep your bones so that your bones could be resurrected, right? Well, I can tell you that when you go back and you look at the gospels, 
you'll see that the approach that they use with Mashiach, for instance, which is the approach they use for everyone, is they would have a tomb. And in this tomb, they would just take the body, whether it was Lazarus, you know, Eleazar, or whether it was Mashiach, and they would take the body and wrap it in linen, wrap a towel around the face, and then they would anoint the body, maybe wash the body and anoint the body. And then they would put the body in the tomb. And when they put the body in the tomb, then the body would naturally decay and it would de de decay pretty quickly when it was just laying out, right? And so the body would decay pretty quickly. And after a year, they would be able to come back in and it would be just the bones of the body. Then they would take the bones and they'd gather the bones into an ossuary. They would put it into a box. They put all the bones in the box and they put the box up on the shelf. So now all of a sudden, you know, in a in a typical mausoleum like you see in some of the bigger you know, some of the bigger you know privately owned mausoleums where families have a mausoleum, where maybe you can get eight people in, you know, you could actually you could stack probably sixty four people if you had if you were treating the bodies this way. Now there's a whole bunch of things about this. Number one, if somebody is not dead and you entomb them, they can come out of the tomb, as compared to trying to scratch their way out of the coffin. Number two. When they, you know, all of a sudden your storage facility goes from being someplace that's trying to accommodate a full size coffin into accommodating a box that's, you know, the length of the femur and, and not much, not much wider. I mean, you could, you could carry the whole human body in a, you know, eight inch tall, 24 inch wide, 36 inch long box. This would contain the whole human body. The bones of the human body would be able to be retained in that and be able to be retained respectfully and so on and so forth. And so it solves the problem of storage. So the cremation is an, is an interesting issue. So uh, yeah, it's, it is, um, it's found in, uh, I think it's Amos 2.1. Let me see if I can find a, if I can find a quote of this. I mean, who knows if I can or not, I don't know. I mean, you know, the way this computer is going today, nothing likes me, but um, we'll see if I can get something you know, to arrives here. Okay. So uh, that, so in, in terms of the issue in, um, in terms of incineration and cremation, what I would say to you is, is that I think we need another solution. And I do think the best solution is, as I explained to you, to follow the Gospels, which is to have the body lie and wait in a tomb for a year until the flesh is completely decayed. All the flesh is gone, cartilage is gone, all of that. Gather the bones, put the bones into an ossuary that's small and compact that fits the body. And then, boom, put that in a shelf that's clearly marked. That's the best way to do it, I think. Okay, do our pets continue after death? Well, we had another discussion about this too, Dr. Grace, and it's good to hear from you, by the way, that, um, that well, we believe that we agree that because pets have nephashes and we've seen actually in other passages in scripture that yes, the, the, anybody, any beast with a nephesh continues after death. Okay. Okay, so when people go to a medium, could they be really talking to the dead? Well, you know, it's possible. You know, I know that we're, we're all taught that if they go to the meeting, you're only talking to demons. Well, you know, you got one of two choices. You could be talking to somebody who's a wandering poltergeist, a wandering uh, a body who's cursed, or you're trying to wake up the dead. And this is what happened when you talk about Shaul going to a sorceress to, to contact Shemuel. What a, an egregious sin that was for him to contact Samuel because Samuel was woken from his profound quietness while he was waiting, sleeping to the resurrection and not knowing any time that was passing. And here, Shaul wakes him up in his self-centeredness. No, you're not supposed to be doing that. And that's part of the reason why. Okay. All right. Let's see. It costs too much to be buried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, again, you know, if you, if this was done correctly, you know, you'd have family tombs, you know, of course, the thing is the family tomb and the whole idea of being part of a family and all this again, you know, we have to go back to this, but if you had a family tomb, the family tomb could actually work very, very well for the storage of the body and the storage of the body. And then after a period of time, you go in, you take the body, put it in the house, where you put it on the shelf, and then the tomb remains open for whoever else happens to pass away during that time. Right. All right. Yes, Sherry Islam has got it right. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up at his coming. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's correct too. That's right, Sherry. This means that some will be alive that were not beheaded, but will be changed. That's correct. Um, will all the dead in Yeshua awake in the rapture? Well, you know, again, I'm talking about the resurrection, not the rapture. And I think the passage that I referred to you today is about the resurrection and not the rapture. Okay. Um, 
Well, now, Stephanie Crow asked the question, how important is the physical body versus the burnt body? Well, again, if I only had access to a file that worked, oh, you know what? Hang on here just a minute. Let me see if I can get, uh, maybe I can get something open here just one second. And I can, I can find the verse for us. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Let me see if this will open for me and then I can pull this up for us. I believe it is, it's Amos 2.1 is the verse we're looking for. Amos 2.1. And um, let me see if I can get to it here. Just one second. Okay. Big file. It's going to take a second to load. Okay. So what about those that are changing the twinkling of an eye? Do they sleep for a thousand years? Uh, no, I don't think so, Mark. I, again, when we, you know, this passage you're talking about, I believe is in First Thessalonians, and um, I just have to get. To, I've got to be able to get to the scripture so I can say it. Um, let me see if I can find it. Hey, I'm getting right there. Okay, very good. So let's see. Uh, All right got to find the passage here. Okay. I'm beginning to look, but as I'm looking, we'll, we'll keep talking about this. So, okay. Yeah, see, so here's something. So let me, let me read this passage out of 1 Thessalonians. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And of course, he's talking about those who have died, right? That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yahusha died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Yahusha will Elohim bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yah, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yah shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yahweh himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel with the shofar of Elohim, that's the last trumpet, right? The shofar of Elohim, when, ya when Yahweh himself is descending, the voice of the archangel with the shofar of Elohim and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yah in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yahweh. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I believe this passage is a passage concerning the resurrection and not the rapture. I believe it's the resurrection, okay? The resurrection and not the rapture, okay? All right, yeah, First Thessalonians 4.13, and that goes through uh, 4.18, okay? Yeah, here we go. So Sherry Pappen um, has put up Amos 2.1 here in the chat, Thank you, Sherry, for doing so. Amos 2.1, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Now, here you see a passage pretty clearly in Amos that gives an idea that Yah is not happy about the idea of burning the bones, even the king of Edom, that Moab is going to get punished because they burned the bones of the king of Edom. So it's something to think about, right? Okay, now, uh, Braided writes, purgatory is still a belief in the old school Roman Catholic upbringings. It is another false hope. Yeah, the, the purgatory, the idea of that you're going to have a place where you can hang out until your repentance is, is, uh, is picked up is, um, you know, not good. And, uh, it's, and, and Ezra makes it pretty clear that either you've repented before your death or you haven't. And actually, if you read the, uh, if you read uh, 2 Baruch 64, talking about the lack of repentance by, by Manasseh, who repented only on his deathbed, that that repentance was not accepted by Yahweh, notwithstanding his prayer, because he was not repenting. He was trying to escape the judgment, not repenting, just trying to escape the judgment, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pixie from Dixie, also in Mark, is not the God of dead men, but the God of the living, and you, you, you go greatly astray. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Crow, thanks for your question there.
And uh, I'm glad I can answer those questions. Again, a difficult subject to be sure, a difficult subject to be sure, but it's one that I thought that we really needed to approach here tonight to discuss this idea of what happens in life after death. And I do think, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a, you know, obviously I believe in the resurrection and the resurrection and the life because Mashiach is the resurrection and the life. I believe that we are carried into life eternal. The question is when our awareness, when we are made aware of our life eternal. Now, Ezra tells us you're made aware of your life eternal. When you first die, you will see there will be others that you will see that are confused and wandering. You will not be confused and wandering. You will see your habitation and you will know that when you sleep, you're going to sleep in, in a profound quiet, awaiting that time when you will be raised incorruptible with all of those of remaining that are raised incorruptible and raised into corruptible to live a life of incorruption in this liberty that is in heaven, free from the toil of, of life on earth, right? Okay. So um, Edith wants to be baptized on living water. Can I do this yourself? Yeah, you can do this yourself, Edith. You can. It's good to remember that the baptism is a second witness. You know, you have the witness of your mouth saying, I'm a believer. And your baptism is a second witness to your belief and your faith. So yeah, you can do it yourself. It's good to do it in front of other people to testify in front of two or more witnesses to testify to your second witness. Okay. All right. Randall, you had a question, brother, and I did not see it. Let me see if I can scroll back up here and find it. Let me see if I can find it. Where are you, Randall? Come on, where's your question? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. Randall, I'm having a hard time finding your question there, brother. Maybe you could re um, retype it at the bottom there, and then I'll see if I can see it and catch that question. Okay. Christina Steele says, my son passed at 20 years old. Has he been sleeping for 20 years now? And I think the answer, Christina, according to what we've seen in these scriptures are yes, but it's sleeping in peace. And of course, you know, I think it's possible that when you're talking about an eternal existence, right? Do we, when you talk about eternity, right? Let's talk about eternity for a minute. It's infinity, right? So if it's infinity, it has neither a beginning nor an ending. And so if you're destined to rise into infinity and you're going to rise into infinity incorrupted, then when do you do that? In our lifespan, there's a time span. Well, we rise here at this time span. But when you're talking about eternity, for all eternity, you've been there for all eternity. You've always been there because you've been there before time began and you'll be there after time began. So do we have, do we have a complete understanding of that? We don't. Okay. Okay. And Bethany, what was your question? Okay. What happened to those who were killed at Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, you know, they kind of got caught on fire right there at Sodom and Gomorrah. And I don't think, I don't think the flames ended for them. They probably wandered. Who knows? They might still be in the desert there in the Jordan. Okay. Bethany, I'm sorry. I missed your question there. I looked for it and I just didn't see it. Let me go back up and see if I can find anything here to do. Okay. Okay. Let's see. The rapture is invented by the Jesuits, not by Yahusha. Yeah. I don't know if it was invented by the Jesuits, Bethany. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Come on. Well, you know, you know what, Bethany, I just don't see your question. I'm sorry. I don't see it. But if you're talking about the rapture being invented by the Jesuits, we know that the rapture is a doctrine that suddenly appeared with the Schofield Bible and so forth. And it's taught in the church. Now, I'm not a big fan of, of uh, the rapture doctrine. And the reason I'm not a big fan is because people are taught the you know, pre-trib rapture that you, know, you don't have anything to worry about. When the tribulation gets here, you're just going to be kind of zapped out of here. And you'll be looking on the mezzanine when all this trouble comes down and your friends who weren't as holy as you. Well, there's no one holier than somebody else. All of sin and fall short of the glory. But I think the passages that are used to justify the rapture are actually talking about the resurrection, right? Talking about the resurrection. Okay. Go in the water in the front and not in the back. That's correct, Tina. That's correct. Face down in the water. You don't have to rely on somebody else to pull you back out. Okay. So Randall McFarland says, uh, so if I have the testimony of God, Sean kept his commandment, but died before the resurrection, but not by beheading, I don't get to take part in the first resurrection. That's correct, Randall. 
That's correct. You take part in the second resurrection, which it, the, according to Kizion, Revelation chapter 20, you can read it for yourself. If you haven't been beheaded for the testimony of Mashiach and the keeping the commands of Elohim, then you're not going to be with him for the, the rest are going to sleep for the thousand years. That's what it says. I, I didn't write it. That's what it says. Okay. Okay. So we can be resurrected in the flesh alive now. Yes. If we get to the resurrection point, if, if Yahweh is going to descend and the trumpet's going to sound, then yes, we'll be resurrected in the, in the flesh. Okay. Uh, what about those that died that did not practice the Torah? Well, you know, I mean, this is a big question, Debbie. First of all, what is the Torah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always bring up these, these questions, right? The Torah, you know, we talk about the Torah, the Torah of Yah, which, which was poured into our heart, mind, and soul, that was written with his fingertip, to which he added nothing further, is something that is in our hearts, minds, and souls. Do you love Yah? Have you found his ways? Do you sanctify his name? Do you avoid idol worship, right? All of these things, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Then, then, then you're practicing the Torah. Right? Does that mean are you keeping the 613 mitzvot of Moshe or the 10,000 or the 1,028 mitzvot of Paul? No, that's not Yah's Torah. Yah's Torah is about loving Yah and loving your neighbors yourself. And so those that died that did not practice the Torah, those that, that died that scorned the Torah, I don't do that stuff. That's a big joke. There is no such thing as, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And you people are a bunch of stupid idiots. And you all ought to be put in a concentration camp for being has, having such wacky opinions because you're criminally insane. That kind of an attitude. Yeah. Okay. Can you speak on getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ instead of Yahshua HaMashiach? Okay. I could, Caden, but I'm probably not going to speak on it tonight because it's a loaded question. You know, I'll just say this, that if, you know, if, if, you know, if your baptism was a baptism in which you believe and your baptism is something that you are, that you know, in your heart was a true baptism, then you've been baptized. If you want to be baptized in the name of Yahusha, well, then be baptized in the name of Yahusha. Personally, I think that you are to be named, be baptized in the name of Yah, because the name Yah is contained in Yahweh and Yahusha. And, um, but, you know, it's something uh, something that you want to consider. But it's, it's something you need to know in your heart. Do you have a true baptism in your heart? Okay. Okay. Now, Bethany writes, uh, it was about Pope Francis. Oh, okay. Well, Pope Francis, yeah. Pope Francis, I don't know how much longer he has. He usurped to the papacy. And he's trying to set himself up for a, re a potential resignation, Bethany. And I think he's going to resign here. And I think he's going to resign and, and try to establish this doctrine of in, instead of being a pope that lives out his life as the pope, that the popes are going to be resigning now. This pope serves for a while, then he resigns, then this pope, and then he resigns. It's going to leave the Catholic Church with the prospect of three popes if he does that for some period of time. But we'll see what happens. Let's see what he does, right? Okay. And you also say, I believe something in the air is coming soon. Oh, yeah, there's definitely something in the air coming soon. Very definitely. What's coming is some real trouble. There's going to be real trouble coming on the earth. Real, real trouble. And, you know, for us, we could say, well, that's terrifying or it's horrifying, you know, and you shouldn't be, you know, addicted to fear porn. You know, what you should be doing is looking to see what Yah is going to do, preparing yourself with what he is saying, continue to be a servant of the Most High and plod through your business like you're supposed to. Do the things that you're supposed to do in accordance with the way Yah has called you. Do those things. Don't do the things that are motivated by fear and by these guys trying to, you know, hawk uh, supplies. You want to be motivated by the things that Yah calls you to do and do those things because we're going to be required to have prepared. Uh, we have to prepare an order, if you will, for those who are going to survive what's coming on the earth. We want to be able to say in the middle, in the midst of this destruction, we have the Torah in the, you know, look at what happened with Moshe in the destruction of Egypt. When Egypt was being just decimated and totally destroyed, Moshe was there saying, I have an order. I have a, a means. I have a way. I have a truth. I have the life. Let's go out and worship Yah and let us find out what these truths are. And so they were able to bring this to the people. And this is what we have to do too. This is what we have to do, okay? Same kind of thing, okay. All right, so 
All right. So I hopefully I have, I've sparked a little conversation among you all and that you're going to have the opportunity to talk over these kinds of things between you uh, over this upcoming week. And I play, pray this has been a blessing unto you. And I pray this ministry is a blessing unto you. So I want to thank you so much for joining me here tonight. And uh, I hope to see you next Thursday again when Sefer Academy presents another topic about which I have no idea what it's going to be. <laughs> but hopefully I will be before next Thursday. Okay, brothers and sisters, blessing to you. Baruch Atah Yahweh And blessings be upon you. Okay. Hallelujah and amen. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Bye.